So I'm going to start with this image because I have come all the way from Australia. Um, those of you who know anything about geography may recognise that this image is slightly inaccurate in that Australia doesn't have this huge inland sea at the moment. This is actually a proposal called Terraform Australis by Hassell Architects that featured in the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2010. Uh, and it's a proposal for a big Australia, as we call it, uh, an Australia with an enhanced um, population 50 years from now. And the proposal is for a massive terror intervention, as they call it a terror intervention that creates a new inland sea um, with, around which new sustainable cities are powered by 100% renewable energy. So there'll be more coastline, less desert, uh, more plateaus to limit climate change to 1.5 degrees over the next century and to saturate the dry inland air as evaporation is carried on pre prevailing winds to the traditional food bowl of the east. And in this process, wildlife reserves and national parks are going to be linked by corridors, enabling the migration of biodiversity, ensuring no further loss of species this century. Now, I chose this image because yesterday we heard from, in the Curators Forum, uh, the Australian artist based in New York, Natalie Jeremijenko, who offered a very similar notion, albeit on a more reduced, um, manageable urban scale, uh, the notion that the Anthropocenic moment is to design actions that are significantly remediative. Um, but these actions are no longer that sort of tread lightly approach to environmentalism. It's very much about redesigning, you know, food systems, ecosystems, connecting isolated populations, in that case of butterflies and salamanders, through um, uh, structures of renewal. So this, um, I'm starting with as an emblematic image of the Anthropocene in that it enacts the very principle of the Anthropocene, the presumption that humans shape Earth system structure and that extends to, you know, atmosphere and to coastline. So the idea here is, you know, that uh, European Australia was settled around the coast, so all the cities around the coast. So we just create this uh, extra bit of coastline. So I'm going to take this um, image, which is obviously a, a little bit speculative and fanciful, as evidence that we are in fact thinking and acting differently, that cultural practice really is changing in the Anthropocene. And I'm going to build on this and take a curatorial perspective, largely, but also a kind of sociological one, in the sense that I'm not going to make a particular argument for the Anthropocene, I'm not going to argue that it's a kind of movement that um, uh, is sort of gaining traction through a number of sort of avant-garde practices. I'm going to assume that the Anthropocene is something that we're in and don't have any choice about, and I'm going to sort of look for the signs of its emergence and how it is in fact um, manifesting in changed behaviour. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, I do want to make a bit of a case for the Anthropocene. Um, I think it is quite, it's an exciting idea, uh, an exciting rhetorical formulation in that, you know, it, it holds that, you know, for the last 250 years, um, we've been living in this era without realising it. Um, that in fact now shifts our entire world view in a way that's really impossible to ignore and beyond the scope of current representational forms. So the question for exhibitions and exhibition making is really not one of representation, not how will we represent the Anthropocene, and not how do we address the theme of the Anthropocene as if there'll be you know, one show, one programme and then it's finished. Um, it's more about thinking about the Anthropocene on the level of a paradigm shift that is in fact addressing us. Now, that said, um, 
uh, we can take various critical positions and the Anthropocene is obviously a rhetorical formation. It's a, 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 you know, a strategy that names something that's already described effectively by many other um, means and terms. Um, and as such, it's, it's readily instrumentalised. And I think, uh, you know, we can make the point that it is propagated by, um, you know, atmospheric chemists who have, um, uh, you know, particular investment in geoengineering um, schemes that need funding and impetus. And um, it's instrumentalised by them as much as by an environmental movement. So. Not that notwithstanding, I think that the way that the, the, the sort of position that I'm going to take is it's something that we all can take some kind of ownership of and interest in. So I am going to use it as an operative concept. Now, uh, when I said I was going to be a little bit sociological, of course, I'm not. My interest is really in aesthetics and curating, but by that, I meant that rather than sort of argue through my own work, I'm going to do a little bit of a survey into weaving some of my, our work, um, but a survey of the kind of stuff that's coming into the mainstream or, you know, mainstream sort of contemporary art. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about biennales, not least because um, there was some uh, discussion already um, in the, in the forum, particularly around documenta. So I'll come back to that. There was a discussion by TJ Demos uh, last night where he asked the question, is documenta an ecological exhibition? And so my argument is gonna be that's completely the wrong question uh, to ask. And it's, you know, the curators will just say no and that's the end of that discussion. Um, but the right discussion to have might be, you know, what are the, the strategies that are emerging um, out of an exhibition like this that is more than any one theme and is not that reductive. Anyway, um, let's uh, get on to some... Oops, Biennales. Yeah. Um, so just to make the point that we can go to really the most traditional of... Biennales, the Venice Biennale, and find that this year there is a Tuvalu pavilion, uh, obviously hasn't been before. Tuvalu, as you probably know, is a Polynesian island or coll collection of atolls and reef islands that is at sea level and is projected to be the first nation to um, disappear. Um, so look out for this one in Venice. But what I really want to talk about are some more um, directly aesthetic strategies. So is the Anthropocene expressed in a work like Guido van der Verwe's Nummer Act, Everything is Going to Be All Right, filmed in 2007, just south of the Arctic Circle? This is a video consisting of a single shot featuring the diminutive figure of the artist striding ahead of an icebreaker. Or through the sublime vistas of Subhanka Banerjee, this is Caribou Migration, well-known Canadian artist. These are both from the Sydney Biennale. I could have chosen many other images representative of a genre that we all pretty much recognise. Or is the Anthropocene expressed in the more contemporary form of the immersive installation where the intangibles of atmosphere can be rendered as sensory experience? So on the left there, you may recognise Anthony Gormley's Blind Light at the Hayward Gallery in 2007. Gormley calls this a climatological and sociological experiment. And what it is, is a glass box of white fog produced by ultrasonic humidifiers. And on the right there, Diller and Scafidio's Blur Building, which was the original architecture of atmosphere built for the Swiss Expo in 2002. And in this case, the... Uh, the, the blur, the mist, is, is constructed from water, pumped directly from the lake and distributed through thousands of high-pressure mist nozzles which are regulated by a smart weather system. And you have to go in with you know, one of these smart suits and all sorts of bizarre social encounters ensue. But the point about these, and again I could have picked um, a whole bunch of other examples, um, is that partly as a function of a new medium and new technological possibilities, um, 
we see this interest in you know being in atmosphere experientially and obviously there are greater and or more or less progressive versions of this um, but also this um, idea that air can be a medium and that I think is uh, of interest in itself that there um, is an increasing tendency to sort of treat the air as something um, not only present and substantial but something that can be um, uh, shaped and moulded in different ways. So this is uh, just a couple more examples, Eckerman and Nestler's Breathe My Air. This is in Beijing. I just like this one because the artist lists the two basic materials as air and thoughts. Um, and then on the right there, this is an exhibit presented at the Milan Furniture Fair in 2009 by Philippe Ram Architects called Deterritorialised Milieu a fine spring day in Paris in 1832. So far from the messiness of the outdoors, in this one, contemporary furnishings respond to the thermal isolation of interiors from outsides. It proposes a reintroduction of the idea of terroir and local climate to interior space via these three objects which recreate a kind of chemical bond with the Parisian context. So it's actually a convection system of radiators made from stone dug from Parisian soil positioned to generate a mini wind. And then there's this double flow air exchanger which controls the ambient moisture using various wood species, obviously from the forests surrounding Paris. And then there's a lamp so you can change the time of day. So it's a reconstruction of a certain climatic experience why is it a fine spring day in Paris in 1832? It's specifically 15th of May, 1832, and that's the day before the opening of the first coal-powered factory in Paris. So the date that marks the beginning of the destruction of the ecological cycle through vaporisation of fossil carbon into the atmosphere. Um, so the thing about this exhibit and, and you know, Ram's other work uh, is that it presents an experience of that spring day within an interior that actually renews air for breathing. So I just want to give you one more example in this vein that sort of brings together a few of these strands um, in a more concerted sort of political um, framework. This is Yang Xiaobin's Ex Blind Spot 2008. And this is a study of coal mining in the area of northern China where the artist grew up. It's a four-channel video installation, so it's quite immersive in effect, uh, in which Yang documents these enormous open-pit coal mines that are like this vast moonscape, and he shoots them at both uh, noon and dusk. And so you get the effect of this white dust cloud rising from the mines. Uh, it, under night and day conditions. So it is quite um, sublime in a way. Um, this was developed for the Long March project, if you know that. So we did have shown this in an exhibition that I did in Sydney called Real Emergency. But it was developed by the Long March, which is um, has been able to fund a whole lot of really um, in-depth sort of research projects and almost ethnographic and archival projects um, at various locations along the Long March. But um, so this one is this inquiry into uh, the destruction of local ecology and community and into the sort of lived reality of China's rural social body, but also um, uh, sort of folding in this embodied reality of living and breathing in this environment. So. Um, central to the piece, sorry I haven't got the video here, but uh, are minors with pneumonicosis, which is the respiratory disease that results from breathing in the, you know, the coal and carbon dust over a long period. And they're filmed in this lung lavage hospital where they breathe with the aid of respirators and the sediment is washed from the lungs. And um, parts of this work has many, many manifestations, but there are also yeah, there are actually diseased lungs in formaldehyde, and it's this quite complex substitution of that image of the revolutionary figure of the you know the work of the miner, with um, 
you know, these sort of artifacts like the lung, and this is the um, the carbonised water washed out of the lung in these uh, bottles. But anyway, we might come back to this sort of strategy. A third possibility then is that uh, the Anthropocene is to be discovered through information that comes to us through global mapping projects that formulate the world as a vast network of geographic and geological data. Now again, this is a very contemporary form, data visualisation that is this, you know, natural fit really for the Anthropocene, which is data, you know, that's what it is, huge data sets, layered data sets that um, need to be um, sort of computed in some sense. So I do think these, th these are very important sort of first level representation and a way of um, instantiating that um, Anthropocene uh, thesis. Um, and also a way of kind of crystallising um, the mindset that enables the, the, the notion of the Anthropocene to take hold. So I just wanted to discuss these a bit in the context of the current Whole Earth exhibition. Paul Edwards has suggested that this habit of mind was forged through the glo globalism of the late 20th century and in particular after the Apollo 8 images. As we know from um, the Whole Earth Exhibition and from Edward's work, he's the guy who writes on um, climate modelling and data. Um, even though representations of the Earth as a globe were centuries old, um, the Apollo 8 images, the, the little blue ball, seem to have this transfiguring power. Um, so they came as a kind of flash of insight when people saw the planet's fragility, its limits and its wholeness. We started to see the world as a knowable entity, a single interconnected whole, but in a way that challenged the stasis of the map because it actually meant grasping um, the planet as a dynamic system. Network rather than hierarchy, complex interlocking feedbacks rather than central control, ecology rather than resource. As Ed Edward says, these are the watchwords of the new habit of mind that took the Earth's image as its emblem. And this, of course, is played out in all sorts of scenarios through the kind of Gaia thesis and the global village um, uh, thesis. But the question that we would want to pursue, I think, now in relation to um, contemporary aesthetic practice is the one, not, not specifically of how we visualise and envisage a network, but how we sense and connect with that network. Ursula Heiser has, has actually made the point that this is no small um, question. She says, far from idyllic or utopian, the biosphere's total connectedness is what makes it strange. Humans have no natural way of relating to such sentient connectivity in whose context they themselves appear as alien others. All the terms, cognitive, affective and linguistic, by means of which we approach the planet, have to be questioned as to whether they don't unduly project the terms of a different biological frame of reference. So this is the huge phenomenological challenge that um, we might um, aspire to meet. And I notice in the write-up from the earlier Anthropocene events here that the term aesthetics comes up, or there's a nice phrase about aesthesis as a perceptual capacity for concern. Now. In some sense, I think this may be obliquely addressed in Documenta 13, and I say that because of the lecture that was given the other day by Chus Martinez, one of the main curators, and she makes um, the case for this show not as an ecological um, exhibition. In fact, she completely repudiates any attempt to sort of thematise Documenta 13. Um, but she does stress the strategy um, of um, sort of destabilising that notion of a human beholder um, and the kind of civil society that defines that, that sort of spectatorship and perceptual capacity. Um, 
And it's an interesting thesis because I haven't really seen that come through in any of the critiques, but it is the way that she talks about the preponderance of dogs in particular and, you know, the sort of Donna Haraway thing that they had going there. Anyway, we can maybe come back to Documenta. Um, I do just want to uh, approach... I want to talk a bit about scale and I want to approach it in these terms in particular, that is, in terms of aesthetics and perception. And I say that because climate is clearly a problem of scale, right? At every level, it's about apprehending something on a vast scale that's not directly amenable to us. Um, but then the question for aesthetics and exhibition practice uh, is really one of how we perceived, perceive scale and understand it from this sort of embodied perspective. So those examples I gave at the outset um, uh, range across this scale of uh, perception. So this is actually from Daniel Montello. It's, uh, you know, psychologies of space. So you get the figural, which is the projectively smaller than the human body, can be pictorial or object space, or like a model. Vista, which is apprehended from a single vantage point, um, projectively as large or larger than the human body. And then the environmental, which is immersive and encompassing, so it's directly perceived but not seen in its entirety. And it's kind of interesting because it's multimodal, not just visual. Um, and so these emergent technological means bring this into being um, through a whole sort of genre of works at the moment. And then geographic, which is also interesting because although at the largest scale, it's generally perceived through maps and globe imagery that's an, actually an instance of pictorial space and draws directly on the psychology of pictorial rather than environmental. So in that sense, it's removed from the sphere of experience. And we can see this occurring, in fact, through um, the way that images have been mobilised. I won't talk in detail about this, but we know that pictorialising has been a feature of the environmental movement for a long time. Ursula Heiser um, makes this point in her book, but, um, uh, you know, we still see it in the, you know, it's the most well-known campaign today, the 350.org, um, named after the target of... Um, stabilising emissions at, you know, 350 parts per million. And the whole um, uh, organising principle of this campaign is it takes this broadcast mode. It's about global activism, not really art, but, um, you know, the idea is it's pictorial and you do something where the emblem can actually be seen from outer space. So um, I just show that because, although it's quite a good campaign, but it has this really banal notion of art and representation. And I think now it's not that we have uh, left that behind, but technologically we're able to push these questions a little bit further. And so one example would be this exhibition that's just opened at um, Ars Electronica. Again, a number of um, examples we could pick. Um, but it's framed as a high-definition examination of the multifarious interrelationships between the micro and macrocosm among lo local and global facts and circumstances. It's titled In Touch with the Earth. A key role in this close-up encounter is played by new technologies and imaging procedures that deliver sensational impressions of the processes at work within our planet's ecosystem. So the whole idea is pushing towards interacting now with the world as a dynamic system. And um, just to kind of own up to this, I do have this little sideline. We have um, an immersive interactive um, facility in the institute where I, or that I direct at UNSW. And um, we are doing this project called Atmoscape, which hopefully you can see that's, oh. Uh, it's a, you have to believe me, it's um, modelling of um, atmospheric data. And I just mention this here because in, the con in connection with Synapse, we've been discussing the art-science um, collaboration um, and some very good examples that are artist-led and artist-controlled. This one is very much driven 
by um, climate. So what you see there, it's a um, 30 metre surround screen. And so you see this in 3D and it's sort of fully encompassing, but these are obviously just test shots on, you know, Vimeo. Um, and so it's yeah, remote sensing visualisation system. And the other project that we've got is even more bizarre in a way. It's a um, holography project with a haptic interface. And the thing about that is you can um, vary the ratio. So it doesn't have to be one to one. Um, you adjust the, you know, the viewing frustum of the um, hologram so you can actually touch or physically encounter stuff like this, you know, this um, atmospheric phenomena. And, um, you know, there's this sort of techno-sublime element, I guess. I mean, it's a project that actually artists and phenomenologists wouldn't have set up in those terms, but it's an interesting one to kind of come in on um, because, you know, you have to ask the question, what, what is the natural interface here? Does it make sense to kind of touch this stuff and, you know, at such a scale? And I, you know, I'm kind of open-minded and slightly sceptical on this, but it will be interesting to see. We're actually working with a vision scientist to see um, how this does pan out. But anyway, back to Earth. Um, there is, I think, a similar uncertainty at the level of ethics and uh, personal agency. You know, there's this kind of crisis of agency, as, as someone said in the forum the other day. Um, in that macro effects are now understood to be the result of these vast aggregations of micro causes. Um, obviously, the one world image plays into eco politics at various levels and is corporatized. It's a you know in this sort of Promethean image, so it's galvanizing across a broad political spectrum, but also produces this anxiety. Um, it, it, through the visualisation of global vulnerability. I just wanted to get that last Van Trier in there, but we won't talk about that in detail. Um, Timothy Clark has written recently about the derangements of scale that arise in relation to climate change. And yeah, I just want to think about these affectively a bit in relation to this anxiety. Because what's happening is there's this barely calculable, cal calculable non-human agency bringing about a general confusion and an unfocused sense of delegitimation and uncertainty, a confusion of previously clear arenas of action or concepts of equity. And I think here, you know, we have we've moved sort of up a notch from globalization, which is now a familiar trope, and it, you know, so certainly the way we would um, uh, approach globalization in a kind of curatorial framework, where it has been an organizing principle of large scale exhibitions for a long time. But globalization, it seems to me, was largely conceptualized in terms of effects and dispersal to the margins, even though it's still, you know, a wicked problem, uh, you know, maybe we can identify strands and the whole thing about, you know, a butterfly flaps its wings in New York and someone in Tasmania loses their job or goes bankrupt. I think that kind of cause and effect or the ripple effect, although complex and distributed, has been witnessed through, um, uh, you know, a whole bunch of, obviously the global financial crisis, 9-11, you know, this kind of stuff did happen. But now we're in a different regime where we have to think of ourselves as culpable, responsible agents without really um, any, any sort of direct recognition of agency. So that's where this sense of delegitimation comes in, which I think is a kind of lived effect, because received concepts of agency and rationality and the old language of ethical responsibility and activism doesn't really map on to what's going on now with its sort of human-to-human -human hierarchies. Um, so scale effects are very confusing. Um, as Clark says, they're confusing because they take the daily equations of moral and political accounting and drop them into both a zero and an infinity. The greater the number of people engaged in modern forms of consumption, the less the relative influence or responsibility of each, but the worse the cumulative impact of their insignificance. 
So this is how you get the situation where overfilling the kettle contributes to the destruction of the planet, buying a hybrid car or not washing your hotel towels can actually save the planet. There's this kind of obvious disconnect between the amount of thought and energy that's, that's going in here. And to that end, I just thought I'd reference this work that we, it's Usman Haq, um, and it's a work that we included in a project that we did, one of the curating cities. This is a long-term project that I'm involved in, and we did an instantiation of that in Sydney in 2011. And we had this project across a number of venues. Um, what it is, is a city-wide network of carbon sinking plants. And so these plant boxes and are actually um, linked to these domestic appliances like that little lamp and there's a fan and some other stuff. Um, people check them out of the gallery and so they go to schools and they go to homes and then there's this whole network that you can monitor on the web. Um, so the whole idea is that it's a um, uh, sort of self-contained system and it enacts a version of the kind of prisoner's dilemma because you're only allowed, everyone's got their little appliance, but you're only allowed to draw from the system as much energy as can be offset by the number of plants in the system, right? So um, you get these little readouts that tell you um, uh, how much energy there is to be used and then you can elect whether you want to... Um, the, uh, um, switch on your device even if there's not enough carbon sinking capacity left so you can decide to override the whole thing go I'm going to be selfish and then you put on your lamp and someone's plant's going to die right you, someone gets a message over in some other place you know that some nasty kid in international grammar school has killed your plant and it's supposed to work by an injection of vinegar to that <laughs> whichever plant is selected so it's quite a nice metaphor, as you can see. Um, you know, it's quite playful and witty, and, and it does sort of say something about that kind of distributed agency. Um, but in a way, I love that guy because, you know, that his sort of demeanour says it all. This is totally kind of affectless, and it just plays on that notion that, you know, really we're talking in the end about switching on a lamp or a toaster for 30 seconds and, you know, it still, it kind of plays out that whole sort of um, disconnect and uh, discrepancy of scale in quite a nice way. And obviously at the other end um, of the um, spectrum, uh, there's this work that was in um, uh, Documenta too, uh, um, Amy Balkin's public smog, which, as you may know, she's been um, running for a number of years. Basically, what she does is creates parks in the atmosphere by buying carbon credits on an emissions trading market. And so she can assert ownership to big tracts of smog um, and establish parks in the atmosphere. So the first one was in LA, and then she did one over Europe. And the thing that was in Documenta was um, this next phase of the project where she tried to petition the World um, Heritage Organization to get World Heritage listing for the atmosphere. And of course, the whole thing was that it didn't work because you need a nation state to petition um, the uh, World Heritage Organization and there wasn't a state. So it just kind of plays out. There's a lot of critiques at this, the other end as well, like the Eleanor Ostrom kind of uh, position that, that says, you know, the idea that there are these large-scale um, agencies or that, that can um, bring about behaviour change because they can impose enforceable rules, I mean, that, that kind of isn't in place any longer either. So, where is the location of eco-art? Um, in that case, it's a sort of conceptual zone, but important because it's brought into um, being as a kind of realisable zone, so previously out of scope, but here it is. But um, it, 
also there's there's kind of work that is going on that really does sort of localize and address the discrepancy between scale and experience um, and you know how this kind of realization actually occurs so um, Average global temperature has no correlate in living conditions. It's necessarily a matter of, um, uh, you know, science and data. As Edward says, because of its long-term statistical character, even local climate change is difficult to grasp experientially. And I think, you know, even those of us who are um, converts, I mean, that's the case. How do you, there is climate variability, so it can't be read ever on this sort of localised level. So this shock effect, I think, is a key um, phenomenon, not just in terms of turning a few non-believers, but it kind of is the pattern of how um, the Anthropocene is sort of coming into being in a kind of real sort of sociological sense. And I think that this to me is an, you know, interesting as a guiding principle of exhibitions. I think you know, coming to understand that sort of patchwork of disturbance, you know, or these moments of extreme disturbance and friction and catastrophe that then shape understanding and experience at a local level, particularly as we sort of lived through um, actual flood events. So, Oh, this on that you'll recognise the Superflex. We did this in one of our Curating Cities projects in Sydney Harbour. And um, it, so this is the flooded McDonald's. You know, they actually did it in a swimming pool. Perfect facsimile of a McDonald's. It's a great video. And we actually did it right next to a McDonald's. And it was quite nice because the um, projected um, sea level rise in that harbour area is about um, seven metres. And this one below is seven metre bar. It's in the same area and um, it is literally a bar made of all this kind of debris, um, real and virtual, that there are real kind of boats and stuff there at this sort of seven metre height. So that was kind of fun work. But what I want to think more about in terms of um, sort of principles of curating and exhibition making is, you know, how we can maybe make these connections across a more, um, you know, dispersed, area. So um, let's, I won't talk about this one. This is Fukushima Esperanto. I can it's a beautiful video actually which I can show you after but I won't, it's too long. I'll <coughs> skip over that. Um, I just want to talk a bit about this work which you'll all know because it's quite, it's a few years old now and it was in the Venice Biennale, you know, way back. Um, it, Steve McQueen's it's video work, I'm just showing you some um, select stills, but this to me stands as quite um, uh, an important work in terms of developing a structure that um, Anna Zing, the anthropologist, calls patchwork ethnography. And what she means by that, so Anna Zing works in the Indonesian rainforest and she has this model of looking at these kind of dispersed communities um, that trace you know, the sort of flow of commodities. So you've got your loggers here and, you know, local communities that are dependent on logging or wood in some way. And then down the track, you've got someone doing, you know, import-export, and then you've got someone on a board of trade somewhere. So you've got these different dispersed but localised communities. And so she's got this model of a patchwork ethnography, which I think is a really important one um, in terms of thinking about um, curatorial principles, but it's also internal um, to works like this. And this, of course, is the work about this Gravesend. It's about coltan uh, mining in the Congo. And so the whole idea is it starts at, you know, the Thames Estuary, the heart of darkness, and then literally has this kind of animated squiggle that, that draws you down into the kind of bowels of the earth where you see the miners doing this um, well process of mining the coal town which then goes back into you know some mobile phone factory in in the Midlands in the UK so you get this whole geographic spread and that I that that is a strategy you know a number of works that do this this is Mark Boulos he does similar thing um, 
in this work that's about gorillas in the Niger Delta. Again, it's kind of, a, it's almost like an ethnographic thing, does a lot of work with um, gorillas in the Niger Delta who are protecting petroleum and then plays them off sort of Jean Rouge style against these um, uh, figures who are um, on the Chicago Futures Exchange where they're trading in that same commodity. Um, but what I wanted to talk about is how then that might be thought in terms of a larger um, exhibition structure. So I want to jump on to um, you know, these exhibitions, major exhibitions from last summer, um, namely Documenta and Manifesta, that's Manifesta below, and then this other one in the Tate, which was simultaneous with Documenta. So it just struck me that you had these fragments of a meteorite popping up uh, at the very same moment in two different uh, major galleries. Um, obviously, there was the fragment of the El Chaco um, meteorite that was brought in this form to Documenta, um, but was intended to be there in uh, its larger form. There was this attempt to move this 37,000 kilogram meteorite that was sort of hijacked. Um, it's a nice story. I mean, that, if there is a case, uh, you know, for talking about you know this sort of um, ecological premise of um, documenta, it might be around this notion of the cosmic ready-made that Carolyn Christoph Bargiev was was very keen on, um, you know, and this belief that the object itself, the non-aesthetic object, exerts a force and a kind of animated presence. So the idea was that you know, if you can move art around the world, why can't you move a thirty-seven? thousand kilogram meteorite um, but of course got hijacked by local indigenous interests and the whole thing kind of played out in a quite an appropriate way probably because the meteorite turns out to be obdurate and resistant rather than dying to come to document her so the story is as you know I don't think it matters the story is the story um, and in the end, it is a kind of reductio ad absurdum, you know, if we're sort of thinking about, you know, the structures of these grand exhibitions that move people and resources around the world for a, a very kind of limited uh, moment. Um, you know, moving the largest object that's ever been moved is kind of a somewhat ironic. Um, but anyway, uh, the one that probably is, in, in this respect, um, more um, interesting, I suppose, is uh, this exhibition that was in the Tate, Tate Britain. It was curated by Patrick Keeler, who's a you know, British um, filmmaker or video maker. Um, doesn't normally do this kind of thing, but he was invited to curate from the Tate collection. And so he's got this persona of an explorer called Robinson who roams around, you know, the British countryside um, doing this, I mean, it is a sort of anthropocenic venture in that the whole project is, is to uh, um, kind of map the whole terrain in terms of these layered kind of geographies and social histories and, you know, geologies. Um, and... Uh, so what he does here is he plays out the whole thing around his videos, but in this larger curatorial project. You can see there, I mean, if you have the tape at your disposal, you can get absolutely everything, all the, you know, turners with the um, sort of effects of pollution. Um, it, you know, Lucia Fontana, it's got, you know, the situation, it's everything. It's, you know, a huge um, panoply and then this map from the British Geological Society. But he does really that same strategy as you see embodied in the, you know, the McQueen and the, the Boulos. Um, in that, you know, that's a bit of his video, it's this, you know, really still shot that lasts forever of this kind of wheat field. And then Gursky's, you know, Chicago Board of Trade where they're doing the wheat trading. And he sets up this quite interesting dynamic where he's really talking about 
you know, the enclosures and the effects of a whole um, kind of history of um, commodities trading. And that really seems to be, um, I, I don't know, I mean, you can make a case for how this does actually um, politicise that, that gesture or the, the sort of turn to geology in a way that um, documenta, I don't know, it's kind of a moot point, but, you know, it wasn't really credited with doing. And the other, um, I won't talk about manifesto, that's a whole sort of talk in itself, but uh, it, you have to say in this context that this is probably the single exhibition that really achieved that um, moving into this space of the um, abandoned mine and doing all this work, you know, directly with, um, you know, coal materials. There's a lead, no, well, the Duchamp. In all of these, there is the sort of ghost of Duchamp, I think, and these kind of, you know, the return of the coal ultimately to the coal mine. So I don't know where that gets us. That's the Clairefontaine, the Chernobyl um, piece. So yeah, it is all about this kind of collapse of ideology and, you know, the sort of environmental and the social effects kind of folded in, in a way that, um, I think, you know, we can talk about how this um, exhibition achieved um, a kind of level of resonance that perhaps isn't there when you um, have this more sort of dispersed structure of documenta. Um, and this work, just because I put that up there before, I just wanted to mention, if you, for people who don't know this, this was um, a really nice work that relates to... Um, uh, the chewed up balls of coca leaves that they have, that miners chew in Bolivian mines. And um, in this work, the artist wanted to source one of those and exhibit it, right? And uh, so he does this barter thing with a miner, he becomes his slave for 10 days or something and gets this little boleo. Um, and so they're all, they're actually discarded after a day, like you chew them for a day, they've got all these analgesic properties, so they keep you awake for the whole shift. So it's this sort of poetic, you know, registration of time. But of course, it's a sacred plant, so you can't <laughs> export it and then you can't import it anywhere because it's, you know, narcotic and vegetable. So he had it and then he had to cast it in silver and that's the same amount of silver um, that would have been mined in the same day. So I just kind of put that up there as a sort of a, a different way of resolving that rock strategy. Um, but anyway, back to um, eco art. Where where is eco art? Where does it actually come into being? Um, so yesterday, T. J. Demos in this lecture um, spoke a bit about documenta and the garden, and posed the question of whether you know you could um, develop a sort of ecological strategy within a garden or a park or whether, you know, there was this kind of cancelling out um, because roses are just roses in the garden, right? Um, now, the point that I'd make about this is, uh, I mean, I do think that, as we're suggesting, these questions of location actually matter, but the other thing that I think really matters is that it has to be enacted. I think there's a sort of performative here. The space has to be sought and it has to be claimed, not simply by an action, but in aesthetic terms. So um, there needs to be a sort of performative role, a kind of slow aesthetics that manifests a problem or a thread within the network. And this work, this that I'm showing you here, is kind of, I don't know, it's kind of halfway to being an artwork. It's um, a thing by a Metabolic Studio, which is um, an LA group and a, and a sort of philanthropic enterprise. It's part of their emerging farm lab project, which um, resulted from a tree rescue in south central LA. So this is actually the site of that farm lab. Um, it was a Latino uh, farm, that a fruit farm, that got... Um, repossessed, well, possessed by a developer. 
and uh, the trees had to be rescued and relocated. So there was this whole project of moving the tree around, which became uh, a kind of performance on the road. It's quite nice, it's very difficult to um, sort of show this and image it, or to kind of capture the moments at which, you know, the art sort of comes into being, if you like. This was it, you know, it was made into video. There are various artefacts, the trees were cast, the trees were replanted, the trees were offered to the city who refused the trees, so the trees then had to be loaded back up. Um, and, you know, they end, of, end up in uh, Huntington or, you know, some fancy tree park. But the whole thing kind of plays out with different um, sort of performance aspects. But um, so there's a kind of Boisean element in that, you know, the trees kind of, you know, trees are sort of reab reabsorbed, I suppose, as some kind of um, uh, ecological element. But the way that this it sort of ratchets up, I think, is really important. And that claiming these spaces and acting uh, these spaces is, is a kind of key strategy. So just on that point, I'll, I'll talk a bit about um, the project that we have at the moment that's ongoing called Curating Cities. Um, as mentioned, it's, so it's, it's mainly about Sydney, where I live. And it is about curating in that sense of caring for, uh, in the literal sense. So the, uh, it's a bit of a provocation as well. The idea is that we, um, rather than being curated in the city, we curate the city. And it's a deal with um, the city who've come on board with it. Um, but we say to them, we don't just want to be given a space to do, you know, whatever, a bit of public art in a designated location. Um, we want to have free reign, we want to do what planners do and range right across the city and look at all these kind of flows, resource flows and, you know, water flows, energy flows. We've done there are whole lots of projects, but this is just one that we're doing for ISEA, which is coming up in June. We're doing a thing called Running the City and there are loads of runs. There's, there's a, um, a flash run that we're doing with Map Office. It's, this one is really about mobility and space. This is Richard Goodwin on a zip line. That's actually the Venice Biennale. But the other aspect of this is um, there's a lot of research on... His research is on the porous nature of buildings. And this is real kind of data. It does these beautiful models, um, in the physical models as well as um, uh, virtual. And uh, it's done some in game engines as well. And what they map is um, uh, sort of public-private space, you know, like corporate space. So there are all these experiments where he'll go into a building and if you can sort of find the, the sort of staff room and make yourself tea and stay there for 20 minutes, you ca that can count as a public space. So then it's all mapped. Um, and, you know, there's this ongoing sort of um, uh, strand of performance. Um, but there's quite a lot of this data now. We've got another team who's done all of this underground mapping that's now, um, it's really good data. It's a, it's a game and you can move through the city's underground spaces and the, um, the government um, sort of anti-terrorist squad is really w wanting to buy all this data because... Um, it, yeah, it's a very extensive map of how you can move around the city. So, um, and of course, within this, then there's a whole kind of politics of the commons that's at play. So this is going to be quite an extensive um, project. But what I thought I might end with as a discussion point, this is Natalie's um, project that she showed um, the other day. Um, the Butterfly Bridge, which provides um, butterflies with help navigating obstacles and barriers in urban settings. Um, so it's a bridge, it's a kind of infrastructure um, that extends habitat and, you know, obviously promotes biodiversity. Um, but I like this because it's this very sort of modest structure 
and I just pulled that off the web and there's a blog there where um, some of the first posts says something about, um, I don't know if it's really up because can we see it? It's up very high and um, you know it doesn't seem to be really visible enough. And um, you know it's kind of a nice comment because there is this sort of obvious function of art that is about imagining and making visible but at the same time what we want to say and what I started out by saying is that we the challenge now is to really think about how networks are inhabitable so we don't just want to represent them and picture them um, and do the sort of data visualization but it's how we get into those networks in whatever embodied form so um, this is a very particular version, but I just want to propose this uh, fairly modest intervention as a potential model for global exhibition making. I think, in, you know, in many ways, the whole model everyone kind of claims to be bored with anyway of the fixed Biennale venue and the fixed time frame show is, you know, unsustainable and antithetical to the Anthropocene project in many ways, but at the same time we understand the value of sort of investing in this kind of imaginative production. But I think these ways of really thinking through how we as embodied subjects inhabit and extend networks are really the way to go. So that would be my discussion point for the evening. Thank you. I was just thinking, maybe just uh, first to start with a very general question. You, you talked about curating as, as the thinking of, of the, this, this term, uh, also curator as the caretaker in, in, the, in the project, the curating cities. And maybe just really a general question about what is the role of a curator, what, what, is, what is the role of curating, and, how, and, and, and what extent can exhibition making by curating extend it? Uh, be, be more than the classical exhibition making in the framework of the Anthropocene. Yeah, um, you know, I actually stepped into this Curating Cities project with a very idealistic view about how um, public art was the way to go. But um, as anyone who's involved in public art knows, it's one big long struggle and in a way, I mean, this is good because we set up this this partnership with the city, and so uh, they claim to buy into the whole philosophy. And then every time they tell us no, we can't do something, or we can't have permission, or or they sort of say you have to do it under the radar. Um, you know, that's all kind of grist for the mill. We can write about it and find ways of doing this, and. Uh, it is a kind of report on the structures in a way. And the same with Metabolic Studio. I mean, that's where they're interesting that they say what it is, you know, it, it's kind of leverage in terms of, um, uh, you know, sort of really um, finding ways of critiquing, well, not critiquing, but actually um, circumventing bureaucracy and working around bureaucracy and that's what the strategies are really about because there is this sort of intransigence there are all these blockages and that's what I um, I mean really get to describe the nuances of the mobility project but that's you know the running in the city is hugely political in terms of where you can go and the speed you can go and where um, you know uh, public becomes private and where all the blockages are so uh, just doing that kind of mapping and then opening it up and doing things like the flash run um, it's a flash run because um, y you have to sort of do it um, you have to sort of let it work at its own momentum because you're not allowed to organize runs obviously um, but you know these are quite interesting um, sort of uh, ground level research projects really you know interesting stuff comes up but so I do think I guess 
I mean, I've been saying throughout in relation to all these different examples that location really matters. I think we have to think through space. And I think that's why the discussion we had last night about documenta and gardens and whatever, I mean, stuff gets reduced to thematization if you want to kind of bring it into the gallery all the time. And sometimes you have to think about where it needs to be. And that's probably why a show like Manifesta actually on the whole got um, a better rap politically than, than Documenta because it did kind of go out and it did sort of work the location and the specifics of location better. So I think that is all part of the materiality of curating, you know, finding space and thinking about being in space. Um, but in terms of where you do it, it's, it's a function of where you are. I mean, you know, we all work out of a certain institutional corner, I guess. Um, maybe this is the moment to open up for questions uh, from the public. We have two questions right here in the second row, please. Thank you uh, for the talk. Uh, I think it really shows um, the importance of having this conversation around the Anthropocene. Um, so I have, a, I have a comment and a question, and it's a bit of a critical comment, but I think it's important to make it because the stakes of the Anthropocene, I think, are, are, are actually posed really well here. And when you say that it need, the Anthropocene needs to be politicized, I think that's actually a point that we should really pause on because I would say for, for the majority of people, it, it is really politicized, right? The experience of climate change is not equal mm -hmm. for everyone. And so I think when Rob Nixon, the environmental critic, talks about the distinction between empty belly and full stomach environmentalism, what he's trying to do is show that there is a disproportionate advantage to those of us who can take it as a sort of leisurely bourgeois habit and those people who are actually dealing with the real struggle around climate change. Which brings me to my question about your first slide in geoengineering. Um, Vandana Shiva had a debate recently with Gwyn Dyer, uh, who proposes that we should have a geoengineering mandate as a way to resolve this problem. And Vandana Shiva, the, in her uh, infinite wisdom, explains to Gwyn Dyer that his enduring colonial mentality of trying to demand the Earth remain under control is precisely what got us in this problem in the first place. And I guess I'd be interested to hear how you would position your curatorial practice with respect to that debate between the ongoing uh, colonial imaginary of geoengineering and those uh, from a post-colonial position of struggle who are trying to resist that logic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, in terms of my curatorial practice, I can't really say that I would do geoengineering. Um, <laughs> so that's a, a, a difficult one. Also, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's an, it's an imaginary strategy. So what I was trying to say with that project is, uh, I mean, I think it, it, it's a manifestation of the license that artists now assume. It's interesting that you would have a project in somewhere like the Venice Architecture Biennale and everyone is doing, you know, terror interventions and stuff on this scale. Um, so I think it, th that is an instance of, um, uh, you know, the kind of... Um, well, yeah, I, I suppose the engineering that, that even, you know, Natalie's work embodies that is not the kind of tread lightly environmentalism. So, so it is in that paradigm. Um, but it, in terms of the heavy footedness or whatever, I mean, there's, there are kind of degrees of that. So I'm not going to sign up uncritically to some project that involves, you know, dumping heaps of sulphur into the atmosphere. I, I mean, I can't see ever um, curating that other than in a highly contentious framework that could be interesting, but, you know, that's not really what I do. But I just want to come back to your first 
point about um, you know the sort of bourgeois green environmentalism versus you know the real crisis I don't know about that because you know I come from a very bourgeois first world nation in Australia but people die in floods every few months you know and we have a really serious um, situation that is lived by people obviously you know people with holiday homes are relatively insulated and they can get out when they need to but um, you know it's a serious crisis facing major cities like say you know Brisbane and uh, so I don't know that it breaks down so readily in those terms and and that's where I am quite interested in this whole sort of shock effect that is you know it's differentially experienced but I think that scenario where you get sort of the mayor of New York um, you know suddenly kind of jumping onto the the, the bandwagon when the flood comes and, uh, and when you get you know this kind of crisis manifesting in different places you do get um, you know the the way that the discourse is taking shape I think is quite interesting precisely because it's it's not really breaking down along those lines but then that said you know somewhere like Tuvalu will be completely wiped out, so and, and we won't be. So um, I don't know. I mean, it's then of interest to me still that you can get the Tuvalu Pavilion in the Venice Biennale, which is a very um, sort of effete kind of manifestation of the struggle, if you like. But mm. still, um, to sort of mobilise that, uh, the, you know, there are kind of layers of irony there, that, that sort of national consciousness that, that is um, enabled through that structure is, is quite interesting. And I think, I mean, for me, one of the really interesting things actually about um, environmental politics in the cultural sector is how we find a language of activism. And I, I have found in my personal experience, I mean, I used to... I'm now director of an institute that's fairly sort of broad ranging, but um, before that I had uh, a, a group that was more focused on art and politics um, and, and a whole lot of critical practice. Um, and I've noticed that actually that it is quite difficult for, um, uh, uh, you know, people trained in a certain form of critique that um, is quite serviceable, and you know, more than serviceable. Um, you know, we would still do really good projects in the framework of globalization, but it, it, it's not kind of making the jump into an environmental politics, which seems to promote a whole lot of um, alliances that, that you can afford to refuse in these other kind of political territories. And so what I'm finding is, you know, we are getting, you know, people from design and engineering and, and I'm, you know, we are kind of working together with people that we never would have worked with on the political front previously. It's kind of interesting. I, and this is a sort of disciplinary thing, I think, as much as a kind of um, an ideological push, but it, it, but it is also... Um, something about how that 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 sort of vocabulary of resistance and critique uh, is sort of jarring up against the kind of pragmatics of a of a kind of climate change politics that seems to cross all sorts of lines and i, I mean i know you can always find the example to kind of you know pull back into that territory but yeah i don't know I'm, <laughs> I guess um, I'm going to ask a more sort of practical question in terms of looking at exhibition making from a curatorial perspective. This might be connected to the first question. But uh, uh, I'm reading the abstract of the lecture. Uh, there are some um, very radical sort of thoughts in terms of how Anthropocene thesis would transform the future of exhibition. And also, how will the form, content, and scope of this global art exhibition change, meet the demands and complexity of this newly defined era. And I did catch a few key words that are you during your talk. 
in terms of the uh, new materials that are involved in the practice, art practice, and also the use of data, um, as well as uh, the inter interactivity uh, in the practice. But uh, I consider these are more of the artistic strategies that our artists are engaging. I'm just wondering, how do you see curator plays a role in terms of um, connecting these sort of keywords uh, mm -hmm. that might emerge from the Anthropocene consciousness? Um, and then also, and the curatorial practice, particularly in terms of exhibition making with the consciousness of Anthropocene, how do you see the connection between the history of exhibition making mm. um, with the similar consciousness? And then I have a follow-up question based on that. Um, is the last, uh, uh, the conclusion line of your lecture, which is how network is inhabitable and how to get into the network um, in whatever format it will be embod embodied. And I, I wonder if this is the line that leads to thinking about more uh, provocative or radical form of exhibition making. And I wanted to yeah. know your thoughts on how these form could be um, except, uh, I mean, in, the, in, in addition to the traditional form of exhibition or the public art intervention. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think through the distinction you're making between art practice and curating, because, you know, I, I suppose the curating that I would do is sort of bottom up to the extent that it's not about um, imposition of a theoretical frame or a theme. I mean, I do, as I said throughout, that bothers me, that sense of thematizing. And so that's why I said I'm much more interested in this, what, what I describe loosely as a kind of sociological inquiry, like what's happening on the ground across a whole range of practices. So we can look at kind of major biennales, we can look on, you know, the fringes, we can look at more progressive um, practice that doesn't get into those biennales, but, you know, what's going on? And then the other thing is the sort of, obviously the, the kind of technological platforms that enable um, new modes of production, like particularly around immersive interactivity and data visualization. So there's a whole lot of um, confluence. And I think if we're gonna say that, you know, the Anthropocene thesis is more on the level of a paradigm shift, and I would wanna say that, I mean, you know, maybe you can't say it technically in the Kuhnian sense, like, you know, the whole basis of science has changed. But I think in the sense of, you know, it's a theory that at a social level requires us to act quite differently and think quite differently. I wanna, say that if we're going to use it, it has to be at that level and therefore it can't be thematized. so therefore we can't come in and go, I'm going to do the Anthropocene show, I'm going to do the Eco Biennale, I'm going to do the, this. So uh, I, I want to see this as a broader sort of emergent way of thinking. And I think, I mean, what I would imagine, I think that maybe for the foreseeable future, like 10, 20 years, this may be the dominant trope in, let's say, mainstream progressive curating in the way that globalisation was the dominant trope of, you know, fairly progressive biennales for the last 15 years, right? But I think that it changes more than globalisation did. Globalisation was about thinking networks and, you know, that was interesting enough and it was about addressing those wicked problems and tracing threads and um, and I think actually in terms of the history of exhibitions um, you can tra trace you know say through the history of documenta like um, Charles spoke a bit about um, how her work flows out of the previous documenta 12 yeah um, and she spoke particularly about that civil society um, conception of audience, but I would also say that that um, whole kind of Latourian exploration of a network and, and the sort of material threads of a network was instantiated in the documenta before. And, uh, you know, all that experimenting around the migration of form 
And so you had this, sometimes it was quite clunky and literal, but like, you know, rope and water, and it's kind of meandering through the whole exhibition. They had that whole kind of bondage thing going that went one to the other. I mean, you know, at certain points it would become a bit trite, right? But as a method, and, and this, this uh, is part of the way I think about curatorial practice. I think you look at the um, experiments and you look at how people are um, not only managing space, but I think this whole concept of resonance. This is the thing that I've always done in exhibition making. Like I've done a whole lot of kind of political stuff, um, like my earlier work. 10, 15 years ago was on trauma and catastrophe and trying to find ways of dealing with that that wasn't the kind of um, trauma porn thing, you know. But, um, uh, and so what that did involve was actually looking at fairly um, uh, diverse situations and finding, um, if not commonalities, ways of, you know, extracting... Um, concepts that could sort of talk to each other across distance and across a kind of network. So I always have paid attention to what it is that can um, unite very disparate works. That may talk to disparate events or bring into being um, discrete events, right? So uh, to me, I guess, I you know, that's a kind of an aesthetic and a practical issue how do you trace those connections? And so I could do a very long and boring thing about, you know, looking at different exhibitions. And that's, the, you know, I'm obviously talking here in the context of a curated show and a sort of a group exhibition, if you like, of, you know, coming from um, different sources. So anyway, this comes back to your question. How do you deal with that, um, uh, the question of this sort of differential experience and that I think again you know there are all these like documenta 11 you know this whole thing of uneven development and what do you do if you know there's a work about a well in Senegal and then it's compared with this you know something on our doorstep I mean there has to be a kind of strategy for doing that and I think that was um, that was the kind of project of globalization and it's now kind of taken on a few more layers, but I probably need to kind of do <laughs> an hour for that, that question. Um, I, I would like to um, connect a little to this uh, point, um, which is the question of uh, interdisciplinarity in uh, the curatorial practice, uh, which was actually um, yeah, inherent in many uh, uh, pieces you showed in your presentation, mm. and which we actually, um, saw also um, in the many presentations we had during the curator's workshop now these days um, with people coming or working on uh, geology or geomorphology or um, anthropology, physics, etc. Um, from your point of view, how do these new forms of uh, practice and knowledge production influence exhibition making now and possibly in the future? Yeah. Um Gosh, <laughs> interdisciplinarity. Um, you know, interdisciplinarity is something that I kind of work with on a daily basis in the, in the sort of hardcore sense of how do you really talk across, you know, the sort of STEM and non-STEM disciplines. And, it, you know, uh, there are really big manifest differences there. And that, in fact, that um, visualisation work I showed, I mean, I, that's a completely un, unresolved interdisciplinary project because these things are driven by so many competing um, uh, interests, if you like. You know, you've got your AI people building something and then you've got your climate scientists on the other with this sense of how they want the data visualised. And how does it become an art project? And it, it, that's a really interesting um, process to resolve. And I think that, um, you know, sometimes artists are a bit kind of romantic about that, you know, and, and want 
want the kind of um, enabling discipli disciplines to kind of be just that. And it, so it is really hard to to actually work out how these things cash out. But because I, I, the projects that I'm involved in tend to be, uh, you know, politi politically uh, motivated or, um, you know, ecological or, you know, whatever they are, yet you often have to allow for the fact that um, a whole lot of the outcomes aren't um, primarily aesthetic. And so I think this is... This is what we, you know, we usually have these large research projects with multiple outcomes, and obviously we don't just do, you know, a crap show that looks bad. You know, they have to take the form that they need to take. Um, but I think that where interdisciplinarity takes you is along very different paths, where you end up producing things that you never expected to produce, and then maybe you do a different show, sort of three years later, but it, it certainly isn't the case that everything's travelling down the road and the show is just enriched by interdisciplinarity. I don't... And it generally doesn't work in that way, you know. You, you don't get this sort of enriched exhibition. You have to go on a, a kind of big excursus and actually think about where things need to be and what sort of staging points there are. So I think it's a big process. But it becomes more than curating and more than exhibition. You can't really do genuine interdisciplinarity just as a show, right? Or a single curatorial project, because that's not what it is. But, but I think, I mean, I'm actually interested in reorganising disciplines. So that's why I have this other life running an institute, because that's what it's about. And that's what, I mean, there may be similar interests behind the whole project here of doing art and science as a, a kind of long-term research project, you know, rather than, rather than an exhibition outcome. We have one more question here. Heine Banking, I was intrigued by your exhibition and I, speak, I see, see you speaking now really from your heart that it's hard to bring all the disciplines together maybe a Leonardo, a Michelangelo, and maybe also a Petrarca, because he developed this perspective. So my question, are you aware that we tried in a global change, challenges to science and uh, politics conference in 1990 to create such models? We presented them mm. in exhibitions, and the Erdsicht exhibition in 91 was also in that way. Why do you think we cannot find bridges and look back before the internet because your exhibition mm. shows there were such great nuggets already there in the 70s. Yeah, no, sure, yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and in fact, yeah, interdisciplinary arts and engineering has a long history all over the place. Um, and, that, and that is part of the work that we would do in our institute as well. I and mean, does have this kind of whole sense of there being antecedents. Um, but I'm still not sure that makes it easy. You know, it's, I, I think there are really good outcomes. I think it's absolutely necessary. Um, and I think it depends a lot on the institutional frameworks. Um, and my experience is that even with goodwill, you often have to change them. You have to build structures where people can work together in different ways and often produce outcomes that don't cash out neatly in terms of home disciplines. And, and that's kind of a luxury. You really do have to create this sort of third space institution often to do that. And I think, you know, it, it's a bigger project than we let, let on if we just say at the outset, oh, you're going to get the show, you know. Sometimes you do, and there are spectacular successes, and I think, of course, I think ultimately this is enriching and, and it's not an option. This is the way um, we need to, to work. And I think, actually, and in effect, the way that I do my... Um, you know, writing and, and research in my home discipline, which is kind of like um, 
well, I would say it's aesthetics, but it's really art theory. Uh, my whole shtick is that it, it, you apply aesthetics across a wide open field, right? It doesn't have a domain in which you operate. And so that will be my philosophy and, and my institutional philosophy as well when I'm kind of collaborating with people, like we bring a certain skill set that we then deploy outside of a kind of home base. So in that sense, I'm not really interested in the self fo the, the, the sort of inwardly focused exhibition. I guess I've never been really interested in doing, you know, just curating art in a white cube for the sake of it. It's, you know, just I've never been there. Um, because to me it is about, like I just wrote this book called Practical Aesthetics, which is a bit of a, you know, it's not always that practical, but, um, it's meant to evoke this sense of a deployment that is in a wider field, that's sort of beyond itself, right? So, so to me, that's, then if you have an exhibition, that's what it's doing. It's doing something and constituting something that's sort of beyond itself. If we pair um, practical aesthetics with practical ethics from your Australian fellow Peter Singer, <laughs> then the aim is the goal and the means by which you achieve these goals is a technique to make this happen. Um, I was wondering because I've been staging a work by Philip Rahm as well, twice. Mm. It was called Winter Beach. <laughs> And it oh, was yeah. very fancy because when you do it in Norway and it's a black beach without any light but you can tan, it's funny. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've seen, if you do it in Norway, I mean, yeah, we have the Côte d'Azur here tomorrow and it's very aestheticized, it's very clean. Mm, I know. So I was just wondering whether this effect of total aestheticization uh, towards, on the other hand, this aesthetics that we may call disaster tourism, in fact, in this shift doesn't produce a kind of aestheticization in which the uncanny is uh, neutralized and the uh, technically uh, produced is naturalized. Yeah, and, and if it does, <laughs> do we mind? Um, what, what are the stakes of, of that happening? I mean, I think yeah, I think that could happen, but then it's and in fact, it's yeah, it's very likely to happen. But then it's how what we wrap around that and how it plays out. So yeah, I don't know. That have to be your project. <laughs> okay. yeah. are, are there any more questions? If not, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to Bennett. Thank you. Um,